<laughs> this isn't great. <laughs> hey, I'm James from Smoker Dad Barbecue, and today we are doing some baby back ribs on my cheap offset smoker. So I say cheap offset smoker, not to be cavalier, as this is an inexpensive offset smoker, but there are ones that are even you know cheaper than this. I bought my Oklahoma Joe's Highland offset smoker on clearance at Lowe's. Not many advantages being in a northern climate, but this time of year they blow their barbecue section to make rooms for things like snow blowers and giant inflatable snowmen, you name it. And so I bought this at nearly a half price, and there were ones for even less money, including the one that I saw Jeremy from Mad Scientist use in his video but after a single brisket cook, uh, the firebox was warped, the paint was peeling, and it almost became a single cook offset smoker. And I'm not really interested in doing that, but I am interested in answering the question of, can I get comparable results off an offset costing a fraction as much as a premium backyard offset. Now I bought a premium backyard offset a little over a year and a half ago and full disclosure, I absolutely love it. But there is a rumor circulating that there is a second generation coming out and I'm on the fence whether or not I want to upgrade to it or not. So this little experiment is helping me decide for myself and perhaps for you if it's worth forking out the money for a premium backyard offset or can we get similar results out of an offset costing a fraction as much? So today I'm gonna to be smoking some baby back ribs on the Oklahoma Joe's Highland offset smoker. Let me take you back a little bit earlier when we started to build our fire. Add in some charcoal, some wood splits, grab our grill blazer grill gun, fire it up. Close our draft door, leaving it open by about two fingers width. Let this preheat. Okay, while our smoker's coming up to temperature, we can prep our ribs. Off to the side here, I have an onion that's not part of the recipe, but the game plan is I'm just going to cut this in half and add a meter probe, since I really wanna get a better understanding of the temperatures that are going on at grid level inside of our Oklahoma Joe's Highland. Take it fast forward while we get this out of the package, and I'll also put down in the description below uh, the ratios that I like to use for my favorite SPG, salt, pepper, garlic rub. So this is fresh cracked black pepper, uh, a little bit of Lowry's, a little bit of diamond crystal salt, as well as garlic. I'll put the exact amount below. Uh, uh, but we'll just get these off, pat them dry, add some mustard as a binder, and coat these up with rub, and we'll be ready to get them on the smoker. Use a paper towel to grab a hold of the membrane. Give that a peel. Do the same thing with our seconds. Mustard. And then our rub. I am using a fresh cracked black pepper. That's something that I switched to earlier in the year once I got my pepper can and that actually makes a world of flavor. So whether you use a coffee grinder, a, pe a normal pepper mill or something like the pepper can, and if you haven't tried adding fresh cracked black pepper into your rubs, especially on things like ribs, it makes a big difference. So I would highly recommend you give that a try. The next, the next time you find yourself prepping baby backs like we're cooking today or uh, St. Louis ribs. Do the same thing on our presentation side. Okay, we're riding along right around 250 degrees and it's nearly time to add some more wood splits. I'll fill you in on what I'm doing there in just a second, but now I wanna get these on. So I'm gonna place them behind our water pan here. And for uh, the onion, I'm gonna place one right at the back as well as one closer to the uh, water pan here, just so I can get an idea of how the airflow is moving throughout the grill and up towards our chimney. If you didn't see the first unboxing video, one of the things I'm worried about is sort of the fire down low being drawn up and over and potentially creating a bit of a cool spot here. So I'm hoping by adding the meter probes that that'll give me some data to start to adjust my game plan moving forward. Let's close this up. Okay, let's add a couple more splits. As you can see, we're starting to die down here. And by preheating those splits almost immediately, we get nice clean combustion. That was about 30 seconds elapsed time. Let's close this back up, add a couple more for next time. So now that we have our ribs on and we've tended to our fire, I can take a minute to fill you in what I've learned about fire management on the Oklahoma Joe's Highland Offset versus something like my Smoke North Carlisle. My Smoke North Carlisle is about 60 gallons in size. And this is the size split that I use, which is about a foot long and about the thickness of 
a really large wrist. The Highland uh, offset is about 32 gallons, I think, if I did the math right in size. So it's about half the size. So using the exact same size split is going to cause a couple of problems. We're gonna have trouble getting combustion. Uh, so we'll be fighting dirty smoke. And then if we do get good combustion, we're gonna be potentially having runaway temperatures. And this is going to be really, really difficult in terms of maintaining our coal bed. So just using roughly half the size, what I did is I got my miter saw out and I split these splits down into half. But even when I was running at half, I still had a bit of the trouble maintaining nice clean combustion where when I did a couple test fires, they would burn really nice. And then when I'd add some new wood, I'd potentially get a bunch of white smoke. And so I've taken it one step further. So this is half of uh, our split. I've now gotten my ax out and split in these down into half and I've gone for more of a campfire style fire. So we're getting nice airflow, able to have open flames at all time and uh, using about three or four of these at max is maintaining a nice 250 degrees Fahrenheit on our temperature gauge. And in a couple of minutes, uh, once everything is all stabilized, I'll check the meter probes as well. And I saw the meter probe number one right towards the uh, water pan and meter probe number two, when you see the chart, is the one towards our fire stack. When I first installed them, there was about a 50 degree Fahrenheit difference between the two uh, right away, but we'll see if that stabilizes once everything's on. So with these size splits, it's about every 15 minutes or so that we need to add wood. What I'm looking for, I start to see the temperature dropping uh, towards 250. I can also see that in the meter chart. And the smoke goes from, you know, blue and wispy to just, I wouldn't call it dirty smoke, but it's definitely a little bit more visible. So this is the, the point where I want to sort of knock down our fire and start adding in an extra wood split. If I don't do that, and I let the wood burn a little bit further, we could probably get another eight to 10 minutes out of that. There won't be enough of a charcoal bed left over for that piece of wood to combust. So you can see right there, uh, just in the time that we are talking, that that wood split that we have been preheating has uh, ignited and is burning cleanly. If we go any further, we are now um, starting to fight either needing to add charcoal and rebuild our coal bed, uh, as well as potentially dealing with dirty smoke. So this is about the routine that has been working really well, about every 15 minutes or so, adding a split that we've dehydrated. That's another reason why these size splits are really, really important. Again, I, I don't like the extra steps of having to not only cut these down in half, but then get the ax and break them in half uh, once again. But anything larger, I'm just not able to get consistent temperatures uh, as well as nice clean combustion. So a lot more you know, effort on the preparation side, but it pays dividends when we get to our cook and we want to be able to just keep adding a split or two like this every 15 minutes. So we are about an hour and a half into this cook and that temperature differential that I mentioned at the beginning of 40 degrees, it's not getting any smaller. In fact, we're now up to about a 60 degree Fahrenheit difference between the meter probe at the back, uh, probe number two, which you'll see in the meter chart here, uh, which is near our chimney. And probe number one is sitting a little bit closer right beside the water pan. So we're now up to that 60 degree Fahrenheit difference. I have been uh, spraying these uh, sort of every 30 minutes or so. So I've sprayed them uh, three times, but since I wanna cook these uh, directly in the smoke for about three hours and then potentially uh, move to a wrap. My game plan now is to flip the ribs so that I can close some of the difference. I don't get sort of really well done or maybe overdone uh, towards the firebox and have sort of raw or tough and chewy towards the chimney because there's again a pretty sizable temperature difference. Let me bring it nice and close. We'll go give those a flip and then keep on cooking adding splits or so every 15 minutes. Okay, so I'm just putting a pair of nitrile gloves over top of some cotton high heat gloves so we don't get burn handling anything inside of our smoker. And so our temperature gauge, if I compare that to our meter, uh, is fairly close. So we are seeing about 230 to 240 degrees on great level. We're seeing about 250 degrees up here where the probe is, which makes sense because the probe is sitting up a little bit higher right near our exhaust uh, chimney here. But that is a full 60 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the probe sitting over here by the foil pan. So to not get anything uh, getting a little bit overdone, let's just flip our ribs the other way. And I'm also going to uh, switch sides here while we're handling everything and give those one more spray while we're here. Keep on cooking. 
Okay, so we're about three hours in and we're starting to get about as far as I can take the ends on each side now. So I want to get these in foil. So I'm just going to put a little bit of brown sugar down in some foil here. Place our rack of ribs upside down. A little bit of brown sugar on the bottom. We've got two pieces of foil for each rack of ribs. Start to wrap this up so I can add some apple cider vinegar without it uh, flowing over. Also just take a quick peek where we're at for temperature. It hasn't changed too much since last time. So we're about 140 degrees, which is why I want to move to the foil to help speed this up as we're about three hours and I want this to be done in about two more hours for a total of five hours. Just pour in a little bit of apple cider vinegar here at the bottom of our pouch. And then we'll wrap these up nice and snug. We'll do the exact same thing for our second rack. We'll take it fast forward. Okay, it's about two hours later. Let's take a look at our ribs. Those are probing nice and soft and tender, reading a little bit shy. So I think I wanna now get some sauce on these, transfer them back on the grill, and we'll finish up that last little bit. But from probe feel, which is what really matters here, those are feeling good. Add a little barbecue sauce. Back on we go. Second verse, just like the first. Close that up, let those tack up, and then we'll do the same thing on the other side. All right, I think we are done. Oh yeah, let's get these off. Okay, I've taken shelter under the protection of the kitchen now. As you may hear in the mic, the skies have opened up and it's absolutely pouring. But now that these have had a chance to rest, I'm really curious to see how they taste. So let's cut some open, see how we did. Great looking smoke ring. Nice bark that looks promising. Cheers. Uh, I'm not sure what is really causing our soot type flavor here, but this isn't, <laughs> this isn't great. Um, so try and minimize any differences between which end was facing the fire and which end was facing the smokestack. I did continue to rotate them, but I noticed even when I removed the meter probes they were just black with soot and so i suspect maybe what we're tasting is a little bit what's covering our meter probe is soot and i also uh, saw in the meter app speaking of the meter app uh, while we started off with about a 40 or 50 degree temperature difference this later escalated close to about a hundred degree temperature difference once i imagine the water that we added into our pan came up to temperature and was evaporating, we weren't getting that cooling benefit that we were early on. And so as the cook progressed, this uh, slowly continued to rise up to about the maximum spread that I saw was 100 degrees Fahrenheit from our probe towards the firebox at the front of our ribs to the probe at the back um, of the cook chamber towards our chimney stack and the rear side of our ribs. So even though we were flipping and managing and running a clean fire, I'll give it one more taste here, but it's quite ashy. So I could appreciate if you've never had smoked ribs before that you would have these and say, these are delicious. These are smoked ribs. I've been cooking with charcoal live fire for about 15 years and there's a, there's smoked and there's good smoke. So if you got some ideas, let me know uh, down in the comments. I got a couple ideas on maybe how I'm gonna start to try and tackle some of the unevenness inside of our cook chamber. Uh, but despite sort of best efforts here running a nice clean fire, uh, this does not taste like what offset ribs or even, uh, even my Kamado Joe ribs, uh, you know, should taste like. So that's it for today. Be sure to stay tuned for attempt number two and see if I can do a couple fixes to remedy the sort of wild ranges in the temperature between our firebox and our smokestack. But right now, this might be going in tacos or I'm not sure. Maybe we'll take these to the neighbor. That's a good idea. That's it. I'm James from Smoky Dad Barbecue signing off. Remember, don't be afraid to fire it up.